from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, friends, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they display their famous vile and disturbing behaviors. And how many of you actually say that along with me? Let me know. This week's podcast will be on Ahmed Siraji. Ahmed Siraji's birthday is stated as two different days, so I'm really not sure which one is correct. He was either born on December 12, 1952, or January 10, 1949, in Medan, Indonesia. His birth name was Nasib, which means fate in Javanese. So let's get into some history for that time. The Great Depression and World War II had really taken its toll on the world. China was now a communist country, and Russia had the nuclear bomb, which definitely increased tensions between the East and West, which we all know as the Cold War. The Geneva Convention was agreed upon regarding the treatment of wartime prisoners. It outlawed murder, torture, degradation and humiliation, hostage taking, and the execution of persons in the absence of a court. But things were beginning to look up. Companies could now supply consumers with the cars and the televisions and other goods that were wanted, and everything got bigger. We see the introduction of soap operas during this time, or, you know, daytime television. The first non-stop flight around the world took off from an Air Force base in Texas, and it successfully landed there. It refueled, of course, in the air four times during its journey. Interestingly, Indonesia finally won its independence from the Netherlands. It used to be known as the Dutch East Indies. NATO, or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, was established, which was a collective defense pact meant to protect Europe from the Soviet Union, which was aggressively controlling much of Eastern Europe at the time. It also guaranteed U.S. influence in the region, which pushed the status of the U.S. at the start of the Cold War. And guys, I always love to add this little fact when these particular years come up because some of our more famous serial killers were fond of these. The first Polaroid camera sold for $90. George Orwell's book, 1984, was published. It's a good one. I recommend it. The first 45 RPM vinyl record was introduced. Frank Sinatra was quite popular at the time as well. Others born during this time were Lionel Richie, Jeff Bridges, the dude, you know, Bruce Springsteen, John Belushi, Andy Kaufman, Jessica Lang, whom I love, Vera Wang, and Sigourney Weaver. So this was the atmosphere that he was born into. His parents were, as I said, Javanese. His mother was a homemaker and devoutly Muslim, and his father was a cattle breeder and a farmer, as well as a practicing sorcerer, though the family was Muslim. You see, for many in Indonesia, everyday life is governed by unseen forces, controlled by sorcerers known as dukuns. They are shaman. People believe that they can move around in the realm of the spirits. They would have three gifts of extrasensory perception. 
telepathy, telekinesis, and clairvoyance. So for those that don't know, telepathy is the ability to communicate thoughts or ideas from person to person without having to actually speak. Telekinesis involves being able to move objects by using only the mind. And clairvoyance is the ability to perceive things or events in the future beyond any normal sensory contact. Now, Islam actually forbids any kind of magic and sorcery, yet his mother was married to a, quote, sorcerer. What's even more curious is that Indonesia's population is actually 87% Muslim. But in Ahmed's area, there is a combination of magic and mysticism along with organized religion. So Ahmed, who also had three brothers, from a very young age followed his father and watched his father perform rituals and practiced in what the area called black magic. Ahmed was fascinated, of course, as most children would be. The locals praised his father and respected him deeply for, quote, resolving issues affecting our community, unquote. But of course, due to his parents being very busy solving the area's problems and trying to cast out for wealth, abundance, and love for the locals, he was often neglected. We've discussed lack of supervision in prior podcasts. We all know this isn't good. His childhood was troubled and abnormal. It has been stated that his father was abusive and the other kids around him bullied him. He was introverted, a loner, withdrawn. Most described him as different and would wander off alone to do his own thing. Even as a young boy, he committed petty crimes. He didn't really have many childhood friends, but one childhood friend who was interviewed for a documentary stated, quote, I was here since 1962. We grew up together and even played together when we were kids. However, he started to grow evil, evil in a sense that he committed thefts and got into fights, unquote. In 1962, Ahmed would have been just 10 years old. He later described his childhood as lonely and that he really did feel neglected. Ahmed was not a very successful student either. He was frustrated and committed petty crimes out of rebellion as well as boredom. He did run away from home before he was grown, but at what exact age I couldn't find. And so that's what we have for his childhood. Ahmed was born into a family that blended Islam with magic and mysticism. He experienced abuse from his father and yet, at the same time, he saw how the local people respected his father. They came to him for help in all things that affected the community and Ahmed was fascinated by this. The abuse he endured from his father would most likely have given him the core feeling of being worthless. His father had time to be good to people seeking him out for help, but not for his own son. And when his father did have time for him, often it was not a positive experience. His father performed what was described as black magic, which is most commonly referred to as the use of supernatural powers or magic for evil or selfish purposes. And I'm not necessarily saying anything bad about black magic because it would make sense. The community came to his father for good luck, spells for abundance and fortune, spells for love. These are all things that would have benefited them. So it makes sense. Now, somewhat due to the lack of supervision, Ahmed got into trouble. Children who are consistently ignored, threatened, or belittled grow up without the inner resources that everyone needs to cope with difficult times. It was stated that the other kids bullied him, and we all know how harmful bullying is. So it makes sense that with his parents being neglectful and his father sometimes being abusive, 
his peers bullying him, and so on, he would of course withdraw and isolate. We hear that when he was 10 years old, he was already getting into fights and stealing. At that young of an age, it is usually due to them being self-centered and feel that it is perfectly acceptable to take what they want from others. They have poor impulse control and want instant gratification. In Ahmed's case, it most likely is also a cry for attention. But regardless, we see that he had a troubled childhood. But regardless, we see that he was a troubled child from a very young age. So let's get back into it. By the age of 19, he was jailed for 10 years for theft and violent behavior. It didn't say what that violent behavior was, but to be sentenced for 10 years, I can't imagine. He was released at 29 years old and then jailed again only a couple of years later for stealing cattle because he'd been dabbling in cattle breeding. After he was released from his second stint in prison, he decided to make a change. So he ventured out into the jungles of North Sumatra. There he picked up what he had learned from years of watching his father what was already deep-seated within him and he decided to start practicing sorcery. He said in a later interview, quote, My father also knew some sorcery, and I aspired to follow in his footsteps. I did not learn sorcery from anyone else but my father, unquote. When he returned from the jungle and back into his community, he started living an ordinary life as a farmer. Now he had three wives, which is permitted in the Islamic faith, except they were sisters and that is considered blasphemy. His mother was deeply upset about this and opposed the marriages. She said in an interview, quote, only when he's older, he started to cause trouble. I wouldn't forbid him to marry two, three, four, five women but not women who were siblings. As a Muslim, he shouldn't have done so. We advised him three times, but he was still unrepentant." Unquote. And in total, between his three wives, who were sisters, sister wives, he had nine children. So throughout his 30s, he offered his sorcery services to his local community, and people began to believe that he had these healing powers and the word spread like wildfire. He became highly sought after and had many people visiting him a day. Some of his visitors even included successful businessmen and government officials. This would be, of course, a huge boost to his fragile ego. He was a well-respected Dukun, just like his father. Then, in 1986, when he was in his later 30s, he had a dream where his father came to him in what he described as like an apparition or a spirit and told him to, now sit down guys, he told him to drink the saliva of 70 dead young women to attain invincibility. Yes, my friends. He later stated his father had told him this back when he was just a child and this apparition was sort of reminding him of this, that his father commanded that he do this. Ahmed said, quote, my father did not specifically advise me to kill people, so I was thinking it would take ages if I have to wait to get 70 women because I was trying to get to it as fast as possible. I took my own initiative to kill. That was the reason why from 1986 until now, I killed 42 women, unquote. So for the next 11 years, he would kill. Teenage girls and young women would come to him for advice on how to find good fortune, maintain their youth and beauty, or attract a good husband. He would tell them that of course he would help them. He would then lead them into a sugarcane field. 
he would bury them up to their waist while their hands were tied, assuring them the whole time that this was, you know, all part of the process, don't worry, and then he strangled them until they were dead. He would then begin to suck the saliva out of their mouths and drink it. Sometimes he even hired sex workers, then used them in his ritual, murdering them, because, you know, he felt it would be a more efficient way for him to meet his goal. Now, his wives assisted him with taking the clothes off of the dead bodies to supposedly accelerate the decomposition, then burying them back into the ground, making sure to position their heads as though they were looking at his house. And somehow these murders were going unnoticed. Now, why that many young women going missing wouldn't raise an alarmingly large amount of suspicion is beyond me, since most would certainly have been within a reasonable distance of his home, except perhaps the sex workers, but okay. So in April 1997, 21-year-old Sri Kemala Dewi's naked and decomposing body was discovered by a man in a sugarcane field. He ran for help, and other people came to help dig her remains up. She had been there for three days. The people called for the police or the military. A 15-year-old boy who was a rickshaw puller, he came forward stating the young lady had asked him to take her to Datuk or Ahmed's house and instructed him not to tell anyone. So the police questioned Ahmed and of course he denied ever knowing or speaking with the girl, but the police found her purse, the dress she had been wearing and a bracelet of hers inside of his house. So he was arrested and during his interrogation, he finally relented and began to confess. He said that Dewi had come to him for help because she had had a fight with her fiance and she really wanted him to come back to her. The local people were completely floored when they found out that he had murdered like that. What was even more disturbing is that he had made some of them help him dig their own graves. Now, a full-scale excavation of the sugarcane field had to be organized. He used the same sugarcane field. And a total of 42 bodies had been found, many being so decomposed that there was just no way to identify the bodies. They also arrested his three wives, and one of them was even sentenced to death, but was later given a life sentence. In the end, he was sentenced to death by firing squad and was executed in July 2008. So folks, do you think he was born to kill or perhaps conditioned to? We've talked about children left unattended before and how that can lead to children not learning how to, you know, self-regulate or police themselves. Ahmed said that in his youth, he had felt lonely and neglected. But my personal opinion, I have a hard time believing that he was truly acting out based on his childhood experiences. I mean, sure, they most assuredly influenced his later behavior but I think the seeds were already there. Think about it. He truly believed that if he drank the saliva out of a dead girl's mouth, it would make him immortal. And that sounds pretty delusional to me. But what do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing or YouTube under the same name of this podcast. You can leave me a voice message on anchor.fm backslash serial hyphen killing or consider sponsoring the podcast. It takes a lot of time to make these, but I do love it. And thank you so much for listening. I appreciate every single one of you. You know I do because you could be listening to anyone else and you chose me, which to this day still surprises me. But I love you guys. Have a great day.